It's been a year since the coup attempt in Brazil by supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro. What have been the consequences of that attempt to subvert democracy? France has its youngest Prime Minister in Gabriel Attal. What is President Emmanuel Macron trying to do ahead of the European parliamentary elections? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. A year ago, supporters of former Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro attempted a coup by storming key institutions in the capital, Brasilia. The coup attempt was a clear result of Bolsonaro and key figures in his camp consistently casting doubt on the electoral process, which had led to the victory of President Lula. The January 8 coup attempt posed vital questions to Brazil's democracy and institutions, and its impact continues to this day. We go to Zoe Alexander to understand what happened on that day, who was responsible, and what consequences have they faced. Zoe, thank you so much for joining us. So maybe could you first take our viewers through the incidents of what ha the incidents of January 8, 2022. What really happened? Who were the sectors involved at that point of time? And you know what has been the investigation so far? What have been the conclusions of these probes? Well, yes, uh, Monday, January 8th marked one year since uh, the attempted coup that took place in Brasilia. Um, a week after Luis Inácio Lula da Silva had been sworn into office as president, um, this coup was driven by far-right forces in Brazil who believed that the military should intervene uh, and overturn the elections and declare Jair Bolsonaro as the winner. Um, this narrative uh, that the elections had uh, been fraudulent and that the electronic voting system uh, was fraudulent had been a narrative that Jair Bolsonaro and his supporters had been building for years. Um, it didn't come just the days leading up to January 8th. It's something that they had been really manufacturing for several years um, and which intensified, of course, in the 2022 campaign, um, which Jair Bolsonaro, of course, ended up losing. Um, but all of his um, platform and his, his speeches would always talk about how uh, the voting system needed to be reformed. Um, and so, again, on January 8th, um, a mob of over 2,000 people invades Brasilia, um, having come by bus. Um, hundreds had also been camped out outside the military um, base, and they essentially storm the palace of the three powers, um, where the Congress, Supreme Court, and the presidential palace is located. Um, they storm these buildings, breaching the security line, um, and start destroying essentially everything in their site. This means files, archives, works of art. Uh, we ran a piece last year by Ting Shock, a tricontinental researcher who discussed all of the different elements, the artistic elements that had been destroyed by this mob. Many uh, pieces of art, works of art that were cultural patrimony of Brazil. Um, they essentially destroyed basically everything in sight, urinating, um, committing despicable acts of vandalism in an attempt, again, to bring this message that the elections have been fraudulent, uh, that Lula is criminal, and that uh, these uh, the military, again, has to intervene. Um, this created a shockwave uh, in Brazilian society. Um, the images that were broadcast, of course, across Brazil, but internationally, uh, very reminiscent, of course, of January 6th, the capital storming, which happened in the United States, um, but really, again, created a, a, a very strong response within Brazil and across the region. We had all of the regional leaders in Latin America and the Caribbean condemning this act of violence and this attempt to subvert Brazilian democracy. Um, Again, the the elections which had taken place, which had already been certified, um, which had already been observed and all these other elements um, and really trying to kind of enact uh, their will through violent means. And so um, the response um, from Brazilian society and from Brazilian political leaders was also very strong. Um, we saw that uh, many, many different political leaders, the governors of the majority of the states in Brazil, had a unified response, standing with Lula, condemning the attack on democracy. Um, they held a press conference, for example, in front of some of the destroyed buildings. 
Um, but the episode left a lot of questions um, and made many people extremely skeptical of how exactly um, did this happen and how did it get that far? Um, which there's many, many different elements, which it, over the course of the last year, uh, many different uh, researchers and um, people have been investigating as much in terms of the financing of these actions, who paid for the buses. Um, it was found out that many big business sectors, such as agribusiness, um, such as the Rural Caucus, um, participated in financing these, um, the traditional sectors of power, which are in uh, the parliament as well, um, of the far right. Um, a lot of involvement, of course, in the Bolsonaro family and the Bolsonarismo groupings that were activated during the elections. Um, many highlighted as well that um, what happened on January 8th, again, had been building. Um, so we saw in September uh, the massive rallies that happened in several Brazilian cities called for by Jair Bolsonaro during the electoral period um, to demand, once again, the military intervention. Once Lula wins the elections, the these same Bolsonaro supporters form these different uh, highway blockades and camps outside the military bases, not only in Brasilia, but in cities across Brazil. Um, and so for many people, they say, well, it was this is the natural conclusion. This is what they were threatening to do. Uh, they were constantly calling for an intervention. And so really, how were security forces so unprepared? Um, and there, there's been a lot of uh, investigation and a lot of um, debate about what happened there. Um, uh, part of it is due to the fact that the military was actively impeding the police uh, to respond to the situation. Um, the military wouldn't let the police, for example, go and arrest people. They made them wait, um, I think, half a day or an entire day to even be able to go into the camp where many people were staying. Um, the response of the, the government of the federal district where Brasilia is located, um, not dispatching enough people and actively kind of trying to inhibit the response to these protests. So there was direct involvement uh, by people with positions of power, by different authorities, um, and these have all been uh, being contended with over the last year. Um, and different, um, of course, there were also thousands that were arrested, that were processed um, and tried, um, people, you know, charged with the subversion of democracy and the democratic rule of law um, and of disturbing the peace. And so there have been a number of different um, legal processes to actually get to bottom, get to the bottom of who is responsible um, and what role did they play in facilitating uh, these riots. Um, and this attempted coup. Uh, Bolsonaro himself, of course, is also facing consequences. Um, he is someone who, again, not only motivated and agitated and, and really uh, took a central role in organizing people um, to take part in the series of protests leading up to this, um, but also in, in the act itself. Um, he has been declared ineligible um, on multiple uh, reasons. One of them, of course, has to do with um, the protest that he organized or the rally that he organized in September, which was uh, seen as a violation of electoral law. He also had held a meeting uh, with ambassadors from different countries uh, to put forward this uh, allegation that the electoral system is fraudulent and that any elections that would take place with this system would be fraudulent. Um, and this is, again, it's laying the basis for what is later to be this attempted coup. So, um, you know, one year out from this day, from January 8th, people are still, I think, uh, reeling in the sense of, of, of contending with the growth of far-right sentiments in the country, the growth of a figure like Bolsonaro, um, but also, I think, uh, looking towards the response of the of the Lula government in terms of punishing those responsible, in terms of investigating and getting to the bottom of uh, who financed, who coordinated, um, and trying to and and the fact that his administration has really tried to send the message that 
uh, any subversion of the democratic system in, in Brazil will be met with uh, strongly. And I think that this has been something that's central. There's been a demand from social movements saying no amnesty for those who commit uh, coups. Um, so it, it, it sparked a debate which continues till today and that the impacts are still felt. Right. And also, how have social movements commemorated this first uh, anniversary, so to speak? I mean, a very important moment uh, for these movements to highlight the importance of democracy to push back against what happened last year. So across the country in cities across the country, we saw mass mobilizations in defense of democracy take place. Um, you know, movements, trade unions, left parties that that continue to see the importance of uh, defending democracy, of saying no no amnesty for those who commit uh, coups, um, calling for uh, deeper investigations into, for example, the role that the military played. Um, however, understanding that the current Lula government has many constraints on it because it uh, Lula is part of a broad coalition. Um, he's trying to have a friendly and a favorable relationship with the military, but of course it's very difficult given um, how much the military has colluded with the far right, with Jair Bolsonaro. We know that under the government of Jair Bolsonaro, there's a record number of military personnel that actually held positions uh, in his government. This means that they, of course, really liked him and um, were acting uh, in favor of him, not the entire military establishment, but large sectors of the military definitely considered that Bolsonaro was a favorable force when he was uh, president. And so people were out on the streets again in Sao Paulo and Brasilia, uh, in different cities uh, to continue this struggle in defense of democracy. I think people recognize the fact that uh, when Lula won the elections, he didn't win in a landslide, despite everything that Bolsonaro did, despite the fact that he completely mismanaged the COVID-19 pandemic, despite the fact that uh, hundreds and thousands of people died in Brazil because of his mismanagement, because he blocked the arrival of vaccines in the country, um, because so many different things that he did while president um, impacting, for example, the deep inequality, making poverty worse, increasing the number of homeless people just due to the slashing of the social and economic programs in the country. Um, even then, uh, Lula still just barely won those elections. Um, very, very close elections that were decided in the second round. Um, so people understand that Lula did win, but that the work is not over and that defending democracy um, is a constant process and that it involves um, people understanding what 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 it means to have someone like Bolsonaro in office, um, defending the programs of a progressive government like Lula um, and uh, continuing to demand further democratization of society, um, engagement of people, understanding that uh, this political alienation and, and social alienation in the country and really across the world is at an, an all-time high. And so how how do movement contend with this? How how does this defense of democracy, of institutions, um, really cut and, and fight back against this moment in history where people are feeling more and more isolated, more alienated by these systems? So a very, very interesting anniversary, also a moment for people to remember the achievements of Lula's government until now. Um, his primary goal as president was to really um, address the pressing concern of hunger in the country. We know that under Jair Bolsonaro and uh, because of the policies of Michel Temer, um, Brazil returned to the UN uh, hunger map. This was seen as a massive defeat, especially because Lula was responsible for taking Brazil off the hunger map. So this has been one of his primary concerns, addressing inequality, addressing hunger, addressing um, homelessness, and many other elements um, of the socioeconomic condition of the Brazilian people that severely deteriorated under the successive far-right governments. So uh, important anniversary, a lot of um, symbolic weight to it, but also real political weight and real um, uh, an important moment for Brazilian society. Thank you so much, Zoe, for that update. France is a new prime minister, 34-year-old Gabriel Attal. The new head of government has very little experience and his appointment seems like a desperate measure by President Emmanuel Macron to shore up support ahead of the European parliamentary elections. 
Faced with deep popular resentment and an increase in support for challengers on the left and right, Macron's space for manoeuvring seems increasingly limited. What is he trying to do? We go to Anish for the details. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. So, a new Prime Minister for France, uh, someone who, it would be kind to say, has very limited experience for the position, a very young Prime Minister, of course. What really is Emmanuel Macron trying with this move, which is quite, uh, you know, uh, quite unprecedented, maybe? Well, well, obviously, it is coming uh, as a, a desperate attempt to actually shore up whatever uh, support, little support that he can muster uh, in the upcoming European Parliament elections. And it, it clearly shows because uh, opinion polls after opinion polls have shown that Macron has uh, really lost support, uh, especially after, uh, you know, his presidential uh, re-election last year, uh, sorry, uh, in 2022. Uh, and uh, that has really eroded, uh, a, you know, a big part of his legitimacy. And it was very uh, much evident uh, with the parliament elections uh, that uh, that also was held simultaneously along with the presidential election, where he lost, where his party, his alliance lost the majority. And that in itself has created a situation where the president is essentially running a government that doesn't have uh, majority in the parliament. And that uh, Atal is very basically an attempt to uh, to show that there is a new face uh, to his government, to his uh, party, perhaps. Um, but there is a limitation because it's pretty much the old wine, new bottle situation that we are seeing here. And uh, we do not see, uh, you know, much uh, difference from him uh, and Macron. And in, in many ways, uh, Macron is not somebody... Uh, who is, uh, you know, who's somebody who's inspiring confidence among the voters. Either uh, the reason, uh, one of the reasons why the national rally, Le Pen's party is becoming so huge uh, and, you know, gaining that much majority is because of the kind of, uh, the complete lack of confidence that uh, Macron has created and generated within the public. Right, Anish, could you also maybe take us uh, in some more detail through some of these aspects about especially his lack of popularity, what is causing it in the sense of, you know, how has he sort of, why has he failed to uh, to uh, take the French public along with him, especially when the right wing's, <coughs> you know, agenda seems so divisive, why, why, what is the reason for Macron's failure? Well, one of the primary reasons would be how he has been an unapologetic neoliberal in many ways, he has pretty much done the, one of the most damages uh, to uh, a lot, and or attempted to do uh, most damage to uh, what uh, the French welfare state uh, system. And in many ways, like attacks on pension, attack on workers' rights, and that has really, really affected uh, how his government is perceived. Uh, despite, and they have obviously always tried to cater to the more right wing set, like Atal himself was somebody who is, uh, whose only, uh, uh, you know, name to fame is basically the fact that he uh, banned hijab in schools. And that is the only thing that he's known for in his, uh, you know, barely 20 months in pres in the, as a minister. And that clearly shows what kind of government we're looking at. Uh, Macron is def uh, definitely one of those who do not, uh, who is actually uh, dealing with a failing economy. The cost of living crisis is huge, and that has really, really affected the, uh, you know, the working classes in France. Uh, disparities have grown bigger. Like it is one of the, uh, you know, worst cases of income inequality we are, we are seeing right now in West Europe, and that in itself has created situations where the government had to deal with multiple essentially uprising of working class people and whether whether or not they uh, align with the left or the right there was very clearly a demographic that uh, participated in these massive uh, you know uh, uprising and protest movements that went on for months and and there was nothing more than uh, you know violence and crackdowns that the french government uh, meted out to them rather than compromises or at least, you know, hearing out their demands. So in all of these cases, definitely uh, there has been a situation where the French politics is becoming more and more polarized. No longer uh, there is any confidence in this apolitical, uh, so, you know, brand of politics that Macron is always known for. And that is the reason why he came to power in many ways. Uh, that has gone. The brand is no longer viable. It no, uh, Pretty much nobody sees anything 
uh, of worth in it. And that is clearly showing is uh, uh, the fact that both the left and the right uh, are, uh, you know, growing and emerging as, you know, viable contenders for power at this point, despite, uh, you know, the differences that we might see in the left. Uh, even with the opinion polls right now for the European Parliament elections, you can actually see if the left combined has more uh, confidence uh, in the French uh, public and among French voters uh, than Macron's party. And that clearly shows how, uh, you know, polarized and more ideologically polarized the French society is becoming increasingly along class lines in many ways as well. And that is reflecting in, uh, you know, the fact that a party like uh, Macron's uh, will not have much to offer because they do not, uh, they try to appease everybody and pretty much nobody in the process as well. Right. Thank you so much for that. And that's all we have in this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.